And we are back live with Lisa Johnson from Been There, Got Out. We just had an amazing conversation in the Parent Twin Connection broad Facebook group about uh, what to do when your toxic ex tries to brainwash your kids. And we talked about the lies and what to look for and what it's like for the kids and some common mistakes. And we are having trouble broadcasting to the Facebook group again. So since that's supposed to be where this is going, we're going to pause for just a second so that I can go fix that. It's, don't you love technology? I, I don't deal with technology. That's why I'm like, Chris, figure it out. Like, ah, I can't, I can't. All right. We're going to delete the video. It is now deleted. And then That's we're going to come just now, screen. right? It's still going live, right? It's still. Yep. Okay. All right. So we remove that. All right. And now, um, Right. It's thinking. All right. And now we're back. Now we're live. Now we should actually be in our Facebook group. So thank you for sticking by while we had a little bit of technical difficulty there. In case you missed it, we're with Lisa Johnson from Been There and Got Out. She and her partner, Chris, specialize in supporting parents who are dealing with some really ugly, ugly stuff with their ex-partner. And we just had a fantastic conversation in our main Facebook group about what to do when they're toxic, ugly, gross, horrible, manipulative, insert negative adjective here, <laughs> ex-partner is trying to brainwash your kids. She gave us some really good insight about what to look for, how to recognize it, and some common mistakes. And now we're talking about the actions that we can take to approach things in a more effective manner. Yep. So one of the things that you've talked about um, was the mistakes of like, don't play in, don't do the same things. Don't like, oh, you look just like your father or you're behaving, you sound just like your mother or any of those types of things. Tilled us some mistakes. So let's talk, like we said, about the, the positive things. What are the forward thinking actions we can take. Okay. So like, like I said, one thing that's really hard, but you need to pause and remember that your children are victims too right. of domestic violence and they are right. being, you know, coercive control. Like they are being emotionally manipulated and they're not able to recognize it. But mm -hmm. that's hard to remember in the moment, especially with tweens and teens who are coming back furious at you because they have been given the message that you are unsafe, unloving, and or unavailable. Mm -hmm. And they are blaming themselves and feeling abandoned by you. Okay. Whatever the, the reason is. So just knowing that that's what it is. So often kids come back and they're so disrespectful. And in a normal parenting situation, you want to teach your kids manners and courtesy and mm -hmm. what you will not to tolerate. But you don't want to walk away from these kids who, like I said, are already feeling abandoned by you. So it's important to try to take a breath and start using I statements instead of you, you, you can't talk to me like this, but more of like, mm -hmm. okay, I hear that you're really upset. I think maybe it's because you believe this, but it's hurting my ears and my feelings when you're speaking to me like that. So I really want to, I really want to know what's going on and mm -hmm. I'm going to, you know, if we can't like tone the volume down a bit, then I'll talk to you a little bit later, but I really do care how you feel, but I cannot sit here and have you treat me like this. So in this way, you're modeling boundaries, appropriate boundaries. So you're dealing with this disrespect, but you're not sending them away. You're giving them the choice. You can mm -hmm. either stop speaking to me like this 
or not. But if you don't, I'm going to just go out here and I'll come back when we're ready. But I do care and I love you and I want to hear it, but not this way. So that's, I, that's really important. I really like that because one of the things that I always chat with families about is the fact that there's a major difference between behavior. I like the behavior or I don't like the behavior and the person I like you or I don't like you. And so what you just clarified is I still love you. You're still my kid. I love you, you know, unconditionally. And this behavior right now isn't okay. Here are ways that we can handle it. Right. But, but still underneath it all, I care about your feelings. Mm -hmm. And so that leads me to the next part is like the most important thing are these mm -hmm. kids feelings and trying to validate the, their feelings but our feelings get involved too, because it's really, really hard to be neutral when okay. we're being attacked often with things that really hurt us. Yeah. Now, so, so another thing that you had that you can do is to try to slow things down because you want to be as calm as possible. Keep in mm -hmm. mind that if there is this dynamic going on, your child, there's all kinds of things that could be happening, but your child may be being pressured by your ex to say mm -hmm. something to see what kind of reaction you give so mm. it can actually be reported back. So you you have to almost feel like the, this. we often talk about how you're under the court's microscope during a, a legal case. Like imagine you're still under that microscope so you can't just lose your temper and fly off the handle because just think whatever I do, somebody could be watching. And also the most important thing is I need to stay calm and I need to try to validate my kids feelings. So first observe your own feelings and then your uh -huh. child's feelings. And then also think about like, I don't need to address the issue until I address my kids feelings. Like we can deal with everything mm -hmm. later, but I need to validate their feelings because like I said before, at the other parent's house, they learn that their feelings don't matter. So nobody's listening. Nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So if you yep. can just be quiet and make it clear that you do care about their feelings and that you want to find out what's making them feel this way, they say, you're this kind of person, blah, 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 whoever said it, pause and, and, and try what we call as an inquisitorial approach. Why would you think that? Not you're wrong. It, it, that's not true. Here's the facts you should know. But let's do the opposite of what these toxic parents are doing and say, I want to know more. I want to know more like, why do you think that? Tell me, I'm here for you. I want to listen. I know you're upset. I see you're upset. Mm -hmm. I care. I'm going to sit here. I'm going to listen, but you're not going to scream at me, but I want right. to know, you know, right. I want, and, and then use like, I wonder, I wonder if maybe it's this, but do not dictate to them how they feel or how they should feel. So you kind of have to step back and, and let them get it out. Uh -huh. You know, that's, that's the most important thing. I'll deal with this issue after I deal with their feelings. And that's so, um, I feel like that's so antithetical to how many of us would automatically respond because we'd be so hurt by them saying something like, how could the sweet, loving, wonderful child that I've raised so far be such a bleepity bleep, right? Just yeah. like their insert other parent here, right? Right. Right. And I like to say that you have to keep in mind there's hurt under their hostility. Like they are deeply hurt. They are in pain. That's why they're so angry. I mean, if you think about emotions in general, so angry. The other thing I want to mention is by being as calm as possible, there's something, there's a term called um, self-regulation. So I think about when I was giving birth to my first child, I had had hypnosis. I had a doula that was supposed to help. But nothing was working. Like I was in agony. I was terrified. And there was a nurse who was just like, um, the, the doula is like, can I rub oil on you? I was like, no, 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 no. But there was one nurse going, look at me. She was really calm. She's like, I want you to follow what I do. Just breathe at when I breathe. And she just led me. And I was like, oh my gosh, this woman is so calm. All I have to do is pay attention to her because she was so self-regulated and calm. She wasn't panicking. I was able to pick up on those feelings. So uh -huh. self-regulation is when, as a parent, we stay as calm as possible because uh -huh. we're emotionally modeling 
behavior for our children, and we can help them do something called co-regulate, which means process their world, their feelings, their experiences. People will often say, my kid needs a therapist, but, and they themselves are kind of a mess. So it's like, if you send them to therapist and they come back in the home where you're a mess, that's not going to be helpful. But if uh -huh. we get the support and help we need, we can, not that we can fix everything for our children, but it'll be a much healthier environment for our children uh -huh. to also learn how to manage their own feelings. Uh -huh. Well, and this ties into a conversation I had earlier today with um, Tab uh, Thorell. We were talking about leadership. And what, what I'm hearing you say is the parents lead the situation, right? They, they lead, they demonstrate appropriate behavior, uh, which is what she was talking about, about how like we have to lead ourselves first and take care of ourselves first in order to then model appropriate behavior for the kids. Right. And I, and you bring in an aspect of like, if we can maintain that calm from an energetic perspective, the kids pick up on that. Right. And without even having to say any words of like feeling validation, like emotional validation to them, like you were mentioning a minute ago, being able to maintain that energetic or emotional equilibrium a little bit better, they're going to feel that as a less, uh, less obtrusive energy, maybe like a less anxiety inducing experience. So without you even saying anything, they're going to naturally feel more calm, which is going to make them feel more safe. Right. And also think about it. Like your kid comes at you and is claiming something that somebody else said, and you're this kind of person, someone who's right. No, I'm not, but it gets really defensive. It's almost like, why are they getting so defensive? Maybe there's something here to it versus you just being like, no. Okay. All right. Like, we're going to get to this. We're going to find out why you feel this way. And I want to hear it. But already it's this like, I'm not worried about anyone believing this. There's a confidence. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not taking this seriously. Because the other right. thing is, kids don't have agency in a lot of these situations. They feel really, right. really powerless. So when right. they come at you and they see that they can get this strong reaction out of you, in some ways you might be rewarding them. Mm -hmm. Kids don't, you don't want to do that <laughs> to kids. Like you don't want, want to reward this kind of behavior where they're like, Ooh, if I, I can inflame my parent by making these little comments because mm -hmm. often kids in these situations learn how they can play parents against each other as well. Oh, yeah. Cause they know parents don't agree. Well, I mean, if they can play, they can play parents that are in a, a solid marital situation, right. you know, if, if that's like, I, I grew up knowing which parent to go to, to get what I wanted. Are you kidding me? And then you just inflame the situation with this kind of a, a challenging environment. Of course they're going to play. Like, why wouldn't they? They're, they're, they're trying to survive. They're trying to get to adulthood themselves with the cray cray going on around them. Right. 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 All right. Yeah. So another thing that you can do, which takes a lot of effort um, and regular, consistent effort is to, and I, I learned this from um, a child therapist that I interviewed a few months ago named Dr. Alina Boye. She said that kids want two things. And that when she told me, I was like, that's like narcissist. She said they want attention and control. And so, <laughs> but they're kids. So, so they're not, you know, disordered. They're just, mm -hmm. you know, and, and in some ways, a lot of people want attention and control. But mm -hmm. she said that it's really important to spend at least 10 minutes at a time if you can, because a lot of our people don't see their kids every single day. But if you can, mm -hmm. 10 minutes doing what your child is interested in, any age. So you almost get down on their level, even if it's like a video game, like, hey, teach me, what are you doing? I want to know more. You express mm -hmm. curiosity and interest in something they're doing. And they mm -hmm. feel like they have your attention or you say, oh, can you teach me how to do this? So you're respecting them. You're showing that you care and you're mm -hmm. willing to be flexible about it instead of like, I want you to do this where you're mm -hmm. like, I'm here for you. And so that can that can develop trust. And again, they're not getting that focused attention at the other house because that's a whole system of manipulation with rewards and whatever. Here mm -hmm. you have to show genuine interest in what your mm -hmm. child is doing. And it doesn't even have to be like super, you know, face-to-face -face direct engagement. I think back to when I was dealing with my kids, how one of the things we did all the time, and I didn't even know it was the right thing to do, but I guess it was, was we had a dog and we would walk the dog every day to school. 
So that was mm -hmm. something that the kids, the kids loved them. That was like the best toy. They didn't need toys. It was just the dog, but spending time together outside walking, we didn't have to look at each other, but it was like, we could talk about things, kind of catch up if we wanted or be quiet or have an argument. But every day we had those, those few minutes and the kids loved, they wanted to be with the dog, you know, mm -hmm. and, and spend that time together. And even when we did have an argument and I would be like, I'm not going, they'd be like, why are you, know, you but why aren't you coming? Like, it must be something really bad, but anyway. right. But awesome. Doing something for those few minutes at a time that really deepens your bond with, with your child. Anyway. Well, and like you said, the, the standing next to each other, the activity where you're not facing each other. I've heard a lot of families say like, they'll go for a drive and they'll just have yeah. drive time. Yeah. Or I know one woman who had daughters um, who liked to paint toenails and they would go sit on the front porch and paint toenails together. That idea of being side to side sets up an, an, a situation. It seems like subconsciously of like, it's us against the world and it's not confrontational. One of the challenges, if you have a kid that's misbehaving or being disrespectful, when it's like, you look at me when I'm talking to you and that put, that puts you face to face mm -hmm. feels very confrontational and very affrontive to kids. And it puts them into fight or flight yep. or freeze or fawn. Um, like you were mentioning in, our, in the first part of our conversation, and that's not, that's way more contentious than we want to try to create when there's already such contention, especially, you know, I mean, even, I don't know that we would ever want to create contention anyway, but when there's already been some, we don't need to add to it. Yep. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, but those are the main thing. I mean, there's, awesome. there's a lot of things to do, but sure. the main thing is these kids need their own feelings validated. Um, mm -hmm. teaching them critical thinking skills is a whole other big topic, but that's important as right. well. Yeah. Right. Awesome. And, you know, as we were talking, I was thinking these are things that even folks who aren't going through ugly divorces or who haven't gone through ugly divorces, they're good, just connection tips. Right. You know, like you were talking about curiosity. That's part of what we use in the foundations of connection here is get curious, ask questions. Well, I wonder why you think that. Why might that be the case? How else could we explore this or, or what else could be true at the same time? You know, digging into those things to figure out what's going on in their brains and then really validating the, the feelings and making it safe for them to have those feelings. Exactly. Um, and letting them answer. You don't tell them how it's supposed to be. Exactly. Exactly. Lisa, I love having you with us every time you come and every time I see you, we could talk for hours and hours. I love the work that you do. I hate that the world, that the work that you do is needed. I know. Um, you know, that families are navigating such ugly stuff, but I'm so glad that you and Chris are there and I'm excited that your new book is coming out and I'm excited to see what you create with the new um, online courses and such that you're creating so that you can take what you and you and he have learned from your own uncomfortable, unfortunate situations, but also what you've learned through your clients and get it out to more people. So many people need support. So I'm yeah. grateful for what you do. Yeah. Thank you so much, Clarissa. I love talking to you everywhere. Awesome. <laughs> well, again, anybody who's, who's listening in, if you didn't listen to the first portion of our conversation, you can find Lisa and Chris at been there, got out pretty much everywhere. Like just go Google been there, got out um, and you'll find them, but that's their website, been there, got out.com. And that'll take you to everywhere else that they are. So thank you, Lisa. My pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye everybody.